Jesus said, Man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You're listening to Daily Truth. Matthew Henry further commentating on this portion of our passage, Joshua 4, verses 5 through 8, he says this, This intended monument deserved to be made of stones curiously cut with the finest and most exquisite art. But these stones out of the bottom of the river were more natural and more apt indications of the miracle. Let posterity know by this that Jordan was driven back the waters, for these very stones were then fetched out of it. In the institution of signs, God always chose that which was most proper and significant rather than that which is pompous. It makes me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, that says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Now, in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, this is referencing individual people, that God in his sovereignty elected to salvation, that he chose by the power of his spirit to regenerate, to cause them to become new creatures in Christ Jesus, to endow them with the gifts of faith and repentance, to cause them to become Christians, believers. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 is saying that God chose foolish people to despise those who would esteem themselves as being wise. And God continues to do this today. In reference again to individual people, God doesn't just save those who are are intellectual or those who are rich or those who are are elite in society. But God often chooses to save among those who are foolish, those who are of little standing by the perception of society, those who are, as James says, poor. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, it's referencing individual people. God chooses from among the poor. God chooses from among the foolish. And he does so to despise the wise, just as he did with Gideon. God is jealous. The Bible actually says his name is jealous. He is a jealous God, and as the scripture further testifies, he will share his glory with no man. And one of the ways that God garnishes glory for himself and ensures that his glory is not given to another is that he performs great and mighty works in such a miraculous way that no man, no creature could be possibly given the credit. So in the case of Gideon, he whittles down this army and then whittles it down even further to a number of just 300 in order to defeat tens of thousands. And he does this not to make much of Gideon, but to make much of himself. So too, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, God doesn't just choose the elite or, or the wise of this world, for the wisdom of this world is first and foremost, according to Scripture, demonic. It's not true wisdom. But rather, God chooses those who are viewed as foolish in this world in order to make much of himself to show that it was not man, it was not his innate reason, but God in his power, in his wisdom, in his glory that used even those who are foolish to do incredible things. Think of the disciples. The people said, are these not unlearned fishermen? But they noted that they had been with Jesus. That was the difference. It was not their formal schooling. It was not that they had been to the best universities or studied under the most notable rabbis. It was that these uneducated fishermen spent three years with Jesus, give or take, that made them incredibly knowledgeable to where they were able to to argue and debate even the wisest of their age. And so God chooses the foolish to despise the wise. God does this with individual people. That's what we see with the disciples. That's what we see in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. That's what we see in the illustration that I gave from the story of Gideon. But beyond that, 
what Matthew Henry, the late great Puritan, is getting at and commentating on our particular text today, Joshua 4, is that God uses this same concept, not just in his choice of salvation with individual people, but also in his sovereign choice of signs and seals. It was not that, that Israel was called to, um, to gather for themselves 12 stones of marble and then give them to the most gifted and skilled artist and sculptor in all the land to make some glorious, intricate monument. Now, that wasn't fitting for the work that God had performed. God is more interested in that which is proper than that which is pompous. Whoa, 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 you're going to want to hear this. Our next two conferences are coming up quick. We've got first our fall conference. This is November 11th and 12th. That's a full day Saturday and a holdover for the Lord's Day, November 12th. Uh, who's speaking at this conference? Well, we've got Jared Longshore and Chris Wiley and yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. What's the title? The title is The Household and the War for the Cosmos. Now, I know you're thinking, wait a second, you can't use that title, Joel. That's the title for Chris Wiley's book. Well, I can use it because he's going to be there speaking and he gave me his permission. We're going to be talking about the household as the basic building block for pushing back the kingdom of darkness in this world. We're going to be talking about biblical patriarchy. We're going to be talking about marriage and parenting parenting, how to keep your kids, how to shape and form them like straight arrows, like sharp arrows that do damage to the kingdom of darkness, training our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. A full day on Saturday, November 11th, and then holding Jared Longshore over for the Lord's Day, November 12th, to preach at my church, Covenant Bible Church, in Central Texas. You can register at the early bird rate, which will not last long, but you can register at the early bird rate today by going to rightresponseconference.com. Again, that's rightresponseconference.com. Now, our second conference is our spring conference. This is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The title for this conference, Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We don't want to revert back to Christendom 1.0, although it would certainly be a whole lot better than the clown world that we're currently living in. But we recognize, despite the phenomenal features of a prior Christendom, there were certain bugs that we'd like to see worked out. So we're not going back. We are pushing forward to Christendom 2.0. We believe that the blueprints are seven doctrines for ruling the world righteously. What are these seven doctrines? Well, it's reformed confessionalism. It's covenant theology. It's biblical patriarchy. It's presuppositionalism and Kuyperianism and general equity theonomy and hopeful eschatology post-millennialism. Who's going to be teaching us on these doctrines? Voldemort, he who must not be named, Pastor Douglas Wilson himself. You also got Mr. Bright Hearth, Mr. Kings Hall, Mr. Haunted Cosmos, Pastor Brian Sauve. And we also have Dr. Joseph Boot and, of course, yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. We'll be doing seven primary lectures as well as two 90-minute panels with all the speakers together, and we'll likely add a couple more speakers along the way. Again, that's March 1st, 2nd and 3rd, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We've got the early bird rate going right now, but it will run out quickly. So go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com to register today. 